What inspired author Dennis Bach to write an alternative history where Georg Elzer succeeds in assassinating Hitler? Let's find out. But before we do, please be sure to hit the subscribe button on the bottom of your screen. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to this week's episode of All About Books. And I am so thrilled to have award-winning author, Dennis Bach, as a guest. Great, thanks. I'm glad to be here, Crystal. Oh, thanks, Dennis. Dennis is, he's also a travel writer, book reviewer, and a teacher. And we'll be talking about his fifth book, The Good German, which was published by Patrick Crean Editions. So in The Good German, the hero, anti-fascist Elzer's assassination attempt on Hitler's life in 39 is successful. But rather than stop the rise of the Third Reich as he had so desperately hoped, terrible consequences are unleashed. The atomic bomb obliterates London and Nazi Germany wins World War II. Welcome, Dennis. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds like it's about like a real page turner, doesn't it? Oh, it is. It is. Yeah. I'm still thinking about it. Thank you. Actually, you know, Dennis, as, as a reader, um, there's nothing better than a good book. And what makes a good book, to me, even more interesting is to know what inspired the author to write it. So what inspired you to write The Good German? Well, um, I, think, I think it's very, it's very normal and very natural, very human for us to, to you know, think about in our own lives, um, about those turning points or those forks in the road where our life might've taken us in a different direction, right? Like, oh, if I'd only gone to that university instead of that one, or if I'd only married so-and-so instead of so-and-so. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, it's, it's a very natural impulse to, to speculate on, on the what-ifs in your life. Um, uh, and and it's, it's something that is not only natural, but it's really, like, it's really intellectually kind of interesting, emotionally interesting too, but, you know, so like, like, what would my life have, life have looked like if, if, if I'd done this instead of that? And I remember the first time uh, I, I caught myself doing that was when I was about 10 or 11 years old, um, when I was growing up in Oakville, Ontario. Um, in, in our, in our big old brick house, we had this, we had a basement and, and in the basement there was um, <clears throat> this big wooden crate that we filled with our hockey skates and our scarves and, and our mittens and so on in the summertime. Just it was it served as a catch-all for, for 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 things around the house and so on. And um, and one day for some reason I asked my dad the origin of that crate and that big box. I said, where, where did it come from originally? What is it? He said, Well, well, I built that, he said, uh, because back in 1966 or thereabouts, when I was about one year old. Uh, my mom and dad planned to return to Germany. They were German Canadian immigrants and they arrived in, in 55, 56 to Canada. And after about nine years, they decided to give up this Canadian dream, this Canadian immigrant experience and go back to, to Germany where they'd come from. And so he, he built this crate in order to ship some of our belongings uh, to Germany, where they had started from nine years earlier. I was born in Ontario. Um, and so when I heard this story that, that they had come, my parents had come that close because they canceled their trip the last minute and they stayed in, 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 in Ontario. Yeah. But when I heard that story that we had come that close to, to going to Germany, where I would have grown up, um, I was fascinated and I was horrified um, to, 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 to understand that, that my life, um, uh, the life that I knew at the time almost never materialized. I would have grown up in Germany. And so the question occurred to me, like how much of me would have survived that? Would I still be the dentist that I was, um, at the time when I heard this story or would, or would growing up in Germany, uh, have shaped me absolutely in, in, into a different person, right? 
So that's the first time I, I sort of like tasted that notion of an alternate history. Um, you know, so, so it, it really shocked me, it really intrigued me. And so I carried that feeling uh, into this novel. I knew I wanted to write an alternate history based on or sort of like you know revolving around world war ii and i carried that that curiosity um and that that sense of wonder that i experienced for the first time when i was 10 or 11 or 12 years old when i when i first heard about my own near yeah. near, near brush with my own alternate history and so um i wanted to write something that had to do with the war i wanted to turn the war upside down uh, and then I kind of stumbled across the, the idea of, or the, the, the true story of Georg Elser, who mm -hmm. came within 13 minutes of assassinating Adolf Hitler. And in the true history, he fails, of course. Um, but in my story, in my novel, he does not fail. Um, the irony is that his successful attempt ends up creating an even worse situation uh, in Europe uh, than, than the one that actually transpired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and that's another part of my intrigue too, is, is the direction that you took with this. Like, as you had just said, you created a world that was worse with Hitler being dead rather than better. So, um, like as a writer, like what drew you to venture down the side of the, <laughs> the story where the world was worse? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, being a serious <laughs> literary writer, I like I don't I don't go into the happy endings, right? I'm not I'm not much for, I'm not much for the you know the the roses and, and, and all that stuff at the end of the story. Um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I was you know growing up as a German uh, Canadian kid in Ontario in the '70s, um, I was very aware of the anti-German prejudice that still prevailed. In, mm -hmm. in Ontario, I presume around the world. Um, you know, so, I mean, I was born 19 years after the end of the war. So mm -hmm. 19 years doesn't seem like very much anymore, right? Um, mm -hmm. So relatively quite close to the end of the war, um, you know, the, that, that, that atmosphere was still there. And so, so I encountered this anti-German prejudice for the first time when I was in kindergarten or grade one or something. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I, I will never say I was bullied, but I was made aware of the fact that I represented a German heritage and this German mm -hmm. heritage was dark, was negative, was, was sinister. And before I understood you know, the actual history of the war, um, I, I heard stories, uh, I, I heard words like Holocaust and gas chamber and, and so on, and I was horrified. But I was also confused because you know, I, I was like, seven years old or eight years old or nine years old and had no obviously no connection right but but the connection was a generational guilt right i mean i was guilty by association and that had a real impact on me and i was interested on in developing the idea of of generational guilt that that the germans of my generation uh felt and might still feel today um and so and so by having, you know, Nazi Germany win the war in my novel and, and the story narrated from the point of view of William, this, this kid growing up in 1960 in Ontario, small town Ontario, uh, by doing that, I was able to explore that world of prejudice, right? Um, you know, so, so the war turns out, you know, you know even, the world turns out even worse after the, the death of Hitler on a very global scale but in a very personal small level which is what i'm really interested in you know how how these global events affect the individual um it was a great way of developing of working that theme as much as i could right you know how how do these global events uh affect the little guy in, yeah. in, in history right? right so that's 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 what i did yeah and william um I mean, he's He's a really interesting character in your novel and certainly his place within the family. There's some really interesting family dynamics that you've got going on there. Um, can you tell us a bit about the uh, Teufel family and the dynamics that are going in within that household? Yeah, well, um, William the narrator, so the, the novel is narrated in two voices. William narrates half of the novel in first person and 
there's a third person omniscient narrator who, who focuses on Georg Elser, the guy who, who ends up assassinating Hitler. And their stories slowly yes. come together, right? But the part that carries uh, William's story um, you know, focuses on, on, on him, it's the first person, as I say, and his family. Um, you know, so it's in a very loose way, it's modeled after my own family, only in that insofar as, you know, I'm, I'm the child of German immigrants and so on. Um, you know, so there is that, um, the, everybody has a competing, you know, in, fa in, in any family, I suppose, you know, there is the, the sort of the unified family and then there are, there are those, um, those, 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 uh, those competing needs and so on, um, you know mothers and fathers and children have different different needs different different longings and so on and um and and this is very much the case in in the teufel family teufel of course in german i don't know maybe not of course but um <laughs> you don't speak german uh means devil you know yes. um so this this guy's family um you know is you know they the, the mother has come from germany um uh, just, uh, just you know, during the war as an immigrant, as a as a refugee, and um, and marries uh, William's father, and they have a couple of children in the in the fifties, and 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 so like their their life is um is is really dominated by the fact that um, Germany won the war, and so Germans are even more hated um, because they continue to wield power over the world, and so this family has to. Um, has to struggle to stay alive and to define themselves as as um, as anti-German as they can, right? So, so my narrator um, uh, William, the protagonist, he he and his brother are are shaped by this prejudice, and the, his brother becomes defiant um, and begins to resent the community that that has that has sort of rejected them. But William continues to, to do his best to integrate. And so he, with his brother, comes up with a plan that will, that will help, them, um, help, help them enter into or be received by or accepted by the community around them. Like, you know, any, any really interesting character in a novel has at least one overriding longing, one desire, you know, a quest. You know, it's whether it's an external quest or it's an internal emotional quest. And what William wants most in life is to be is to be accepted, is to, is, is to have the community he, he grows up in, to understand that he's not one of those you know, bad Germans. In fact, he is the good German, right? Just like Georg Elser is the man who assassinates Hitler, is also the good German. There are a couple of good Germans in this novel. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I think I think lots of families in, in Canada growing up. With German heritage, felt that that um, that prejudice, that sort of low boil prejudice. I mean, it's you know, I'm not trying to um, uh, call out for sympathy at all by any stretch. Yeah. So when I felt that that prejudice in my own life growing up, you know, it was uncomfortable, but it was it was it was you know, it was well placed really, and it was, you know, the yeah. war was not it was not that long over. So it's something that they carry uh, in their hearts as a family and as individuals. And uh, you just talked a little bit about the structure of your novel. And as a, I really enjoyed the structure, you know, of weaving between past and, and present with Elzer's story and also with the um, Teufel's family. Did you, when you started writing the novel, did you know you were going to build it that way or, was, or did the structure change as you went? Um, I, I knew pretty early on because, because I mean, I, I don't start, I don't write a novel like with, with the story already in my head or anything like that. I start in a very small way. I build outwards from a single character and a single emotion and a single time period and a single setting. And then I sort of very slowly, you know, discover the story as it grows. One of the first things I did realize about the novel though was that it was going to have these these sort of parallel staggered narratives you know and use that structure in and out, yeah. in and out uh, from from first person to third person and back and forth because that is the structure that i used in in a novel that i published earlier 20 years earlier called the ash garden mm -hmm. uh which is kind of like the mirror the inverse the mirror image of this book 
Um, so I, 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 I really wanted to sort of um, uh, establish the parallel between those two novels. And that's the structure that I, that I used in, in the Ash Garden. Now, I know uh, as someone who's finished your book, it was it was very thought provoking. Um, what what would you like your readers to walk walk away with? Like if there's one sentiment or a few sentiments, what would you like them to walk away with? Hmm. Um, I don't know, you know, that the reading experience is, is such a personal, quiet one. Um, you know, I mean, like I, I remember when I when I when I discovered reading. Um, you know, like, like actually like literary reading, you know, when I was in grade nine or 10, like when I encountered a, a beautiful book, a book that moved me for the first time. Um, it's that sort of that quiet interaction that, that you have. It's sort of like this quiet conversation that you have between you and the book. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's irreplaceable, really, that, that intimacy that, that, that an author can establish or that a narrative voice can establish between it and you. So whatever you take away from, from one of your favorite, from a favorite novel, I mean, that's, it's, it's a very personal thing. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a character and a voice writer, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, this, this, this novel has a lot of plot actually, but the plot only grows out of, out of, out of the characterization and out of the voice. Right, and so I mean, when I read, uh, uh, when I'm when I'm when I'm you know falling in love with a novel, it's because I mean reading a novel, not writing, but when I'm falling in love with with a new novel as I read, it's because of it's because of the voice and the character, the way that the author builds builds those those two things, uh, and and lets the story grow naturally. Right, so so you know if the story if the story of this novel carries you away. That's wonderful, um, you know, because I have structured it in, in a way that hopefully that the story moves quickly and so on. But but my first um, my first love as a reader and my first interest as a writer is is really characterization and voice. Um, you know, that's the first thing that you meet on the page is voice, right? The voice is it is it you know first person voice colloquial or is it a formal first person voice? Like what does it sound like in your ear, right? So I'm. Very interested in in, in the music and in, in the tone of of the voice that I'm that I'm writing in, and and the slow build of character, the slow and 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 like deep and complete building of a character, is what I you know when you say you felt like you really knew my characters or that they were very interesting, that is that is something that I'm that means a lot to me as a, as the writer. Uh, I like that answer. <laughs> So, Dennis, what are you currently working working on? Um, I am working on. I've I've got a couple of things going on. Um, I'm writing a, a YA novel. Ah. And I'm writing this. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm adapting one of my novels uh, for the for this for the screen. I'm writing a screenplay based on Going Home Again. That's exciting. Um, yeah. So it's it's, yeah. it's it's good. I'm sort of like I'm 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 moving in different directions now. Um, you know, the YA and the screenplay. So I'm 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 stretching my wings, I guess you could say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, that's great. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'll see how they work. I mean, I don't know, man. Like like all all writing in the creative process, it's just like a it's a it's a crapshoot. You never know, right? It might turn might they might turn out turn out really sucking badly so you know. oh, I, I'm sure they'll be great <laughs> right. um, before you do your reading today I was wondering could you give aspiring writers a piece of advice yes I could um, <laughs> what would be uh, the know, dentist spot advice yeah, I don't know if it's going to be good advice right but I'll, I'll, I'll give some advice if, if advice is asked for yes for sure I mean I've, I've spent a lot of time Working with novice writers, um, you know, I, I teach in the, the the creative writing program at U of T and at Humber College, uh, and I've been doing this for thirteen or fourteen years. And um, um, you know, as well as as encountering or meeting great new writers, um, I also see uh, a lot of the sort of like the novice mistakes that writers make, and I'm sure I made when I was starting out. And really, one of the one of the most frequent ones is 
Well, yeah, okay, we can talk about, I don't know how, how much time we have, Christy. <laughs> we can talk about the show don't tell thing, right? Um, the show don't tell thing is the worst advice that any writer has ever received from anyone else. I mean, mm -hmm. the show don't tell thing has, has hobbled so many, so many novice writers, you know, um, that um you know it, it, it's it's really it's really terrible you know it's like we are storytellers we tell stories right it so so the first the first order of business is show and tell okay yeah that you, you have to tell you know it was a dark and stormy night that is telling right okay you don't have to you don't have to take your character out into the forest and you know show them getting rained on right you know, the, story, <laughs> the narrative voice says it was a dark and stormy night there there we go yeah. Or, or 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 Joe loved Susie and Susie hated Joe. That's telling, and you're allowed to do that. And you should. Yeah. Do you don't have to take them into the bar and and have Susie <laughs> crack Joe over the head to show it, right? So, so, so you know you can do things uh, much more eloquently and much more concisely and convincingly uh, very often with with some with some some good telling. Um, the second bit of advice is maybe um, is is. Um, you know, beware the lazy narrator. Uh, lazy narrators um, just sort of observe the obvious, you know, if I'm describing, you know, what I see on your screen or on my screen, I would say, you know, you have this color hair and that color sweater and there's a green creeping ivy behind you and a white belt <laughs> and so on. And these are all obvious and easily, you know, noticed, but they're not really revealing or interesting, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, um, don't rely on a, a lazy narrator who just sort of points out, you know, the plainly obvious and un uninteresting, um, you know, an, an active narrator will notice a little bit about the, the, the physical world around their people and so on. But, but really what's interesting um, is, is, is the emotional and psychological detail that, that, that is happening in a scene or, you know, you know, that is observed through the point of view of your narrator. So um, yeah, so avoid the lazy narrator. You know, don't fill space with, with green plants and blonde hair and, and dark sweaters. <laughs> that's just like that's not revealing or it's not interesting at all. Um, you know, the, the emotional and the psychological texture of the scene is is very very much more interesting. How's oh God, that? now I'm gonna go back to my work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's nothing obvious about your about your. <laughs> So, um, Dennis, you're going to read from us today, and before you do, can you share why you've chosen this particular excerpt to read? Yeah, well, um, through no, no one's fault but my own, I'm, I'm supremely unprepared right now. Um, you let me know weeks ago that you would ask me to read, and I totally forgot. So when you mentioned it just before we started taping, I oh, God, I, I have no idea what I should read. Um, uh, I will... <laughs> I will read part of the, uh, I'll keep it short, um, yeah. but I'll read part of the first person narrative. You know, William okay. is, is our speaker and he's, he's reporting to us from 1960. Um, and he's, 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 he's inviting us into the world where he begins to, he recounts the beginning of, you know, when he began to understand that, that you know, his family was different uh, and they were, um, you know, they were not, um, they were not really welcome in town, uh, and it, and the reason is is kind of just slowly dawning on him. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is 1960. This is um, fascism rules in Europe. Um, everybody in his town hates anything German, and he is of German heritage. Perhaps the one sign that puzzled me most in those early days was not the number painted on our front door mistaken at that early age for our home address, added to the more recognizable street number 115 tacked onto the front porch, but the nervousness that plagued our father when he was in public. At home, he was calm and happy, or at least he seemed that way to me, the sort of father who pulled a coin from your ear on your birthday or, pl or played Herb Alpert songs on his tr old dented trumpet. But in the street, he was always on guard Come on now, William, get a move on, he'd say, throwing a glance over his shoulder. He didn't associate with men from the shipyard, as far as I can remember, and I have no recollection, uh, recollection of visitors calling at our house when I was a boy. At the annual company picnic, he never played pick up baseball or talked with the men in the beer tent, where so many other fathers seemed to collect. 
he sat with us instead. And once after I made the mistake of speaking the wrong language, meaning German, he raised a finger to his lips and reminded me that outside the home, we were to speak only English. At the end of the day, as we settled, he and his brother, as we settled into our beds after one such picnic, Thomas told me it was the war that dictated the use of the languages we spoke and where we were allowed to speak them. Everything was about the war, he said, even the number painted on our front door. Everyone hated us the same way you hated the monster in a monster movie. I'd see for myself soon enough when school started that fall. I remembered no war, only stories that told of our father's regret at not, not having served. It seemed far-fetched that something that had happened outside the span of my own life could hold such sway over our town and family. Thomas reached for the flashlight at his bedside and pressed it to the underside of his chin. It's the Cold War now, stupid. That's what they call it, he said. The term Cold War was new to me. Icebergs and snow swept plains and howling winds came to mind. So you'd better get used to not having any friends at all. We watched but we watch films at school. You'll see them too. They blame us for everything. Us, I said, the Germans. What happens in the films? He scanned the ceiling with a flashlight beam. We'd strung half a dozen model airplanes up there on fishing line in a perpetual dogfight that moved only slightly when a breeze came through the window. Nothing goes right anyway, he said. The beam traced across the ceiling in a cool, steady arc. He knew all there was to know. There could, be, there could be no reason to doubt what he told me, though no sense could be made of, of it in my trusting heart. I looked up to him in every way a little brother could. He was taller and stronger and smarter than I could ever hope to be. And when he told me I'd never have friends in my life, I believed him as you believe the crystal ball that speaks the truth to you about your deepest and most shameful secret. He'd already learned something at school called duck and cover and knew the location of all the fallout shelters in town. And that in the early days following the war, they'd been, uh, they'd been known as sanctuaries and not shelters. The name made people feel better, he said. It made them feel safer. He even claimed to know by the light in the sky over Hamilton, what, what, what grade of steel, steel they were baking in the Stelco fire pits. I'll stop there. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. That was great. I appreciate you giving everyone a taste of um, your characters' voices. Yeah, okay. My pleasure. And uh, a big, big thank you for coming on the program today. I so enjoy talking with you, speaking with you, Dennis, and learning more about the stories behind your book. Yeah, my pleasure. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, what I'll do is I'll put links down below in the description book. So anyone who's watching right now can go um and purchase a copy of the good german or your other books yeah and yeah so and um yeah so that's that's what i'll do <laughs> thank you very much listen crystal it's been a it's been a, a real pleasure thank you so much for your interest in my book thank you thank you okay cheers bye